As a Catholic with an opinion, my first instinct with regards to the Pope has always been to defend him and his teachings and governance. I've always seen him as intrinsic to my creed and my tribe, and so what could be more obvious than to come to his defense? So early on in the Holy Father Pope Francis's pontificate, that was the attitude and the instinct that I followed. And I have some older video commentaries that tend to reflect that approach. But as time progressed, that default gave way to some head scratching bemusement, but still a lot of the benefit of the doubt. Uh, up until now, in which I mostly just avoid the topic. But because I have published video commentaries on this pontificate in the fact, according to that, that approach that I have used in the past, I do feel the need to update those statements as those earlier commentaries no longer reflect my current interpretation of this era of the church that we're living through. And that's, that's a key thing for me because history is being written. And while it is, it's really difficult to conclusively interpret. Uh, to whatever small degree I exercise influence in the church, I take it extremely seriously. I would be devastated to know that I scandalized someone or led them astray or even left them with the wrong impression about something as crucial as their ecclesiology and their relationship to the hierarchy and the magisterium. And what this pontificate has taught me, if nothing else, is that Catholic ecclesiology isn't as simple as I once thought it was. It's easy to endorse uh, crude articulations about infallibility and obedience when you have bishops and pontiffs who are easy to admire. But if and when you have bad or confusing leadership, our understanding of those concepts requires greater nuance and achieving and practicing that nuance can be perilous and prone to division and conflict. And that's another key thing for me because the strongest evidence that we have of bad leadership in principle is division and conflict among the faithful. And sadly, I would say that the church, especially among those who play important supporting roles in leadership, like apologists, for example, the church is much more divided than it was a decade ago. And that's a lamentable thing for me. There are well-known Catholic thinkers and writers who I have admired and enjoyed the company of from time to time, and some I would even call friends, who because of our mutual attempts to reach this more refined understanding of our ecclesiology necessitated by this era of history and our current leaders, um, we are no longer aligned in the kind of camaraderie we used to enjoy. And in some cases, that's putting it very mildly. I know of some prominent, good-willed and faithful Catholics who have been forced in some respects to take theological positions that I know would have been unthinkable to them 10 or 15 years ago. And if you're paying attention, I think that this increased sense of division and conflict in the church uh, is pretty undeniable. I think if you spend any amount of time on Catholic Twitter, for example, you will get a heavy dose of what I'm talking about. And while I agree that Twitter isn't the best random sample of Catholics, it does reveal how influential Catholics are interacting, at least online. But it isn't just among high profile Catholics. I've personally lost friends over decisions I've made about how I best fit into the church today. Perhaps the best evidence of conflict and division in the church today is provided when moderate voices, far from having a, a conciliatory effect, are treated with as much antagonism as opposing combatants on the other side of the aisle. And for good reason, it's, it's no use offering suggestions for avoiding conflict and maintaining peace once hostilities have broken out. In the same way, it's not helpful suggesting to someone who is in the process of drowning that they should really invest in some swimming lessons. The time for that kind of advice uh, has long expired. 10 years ago, we all would have just happily identified as Catholics and enjoyed the camaraderie that came along with that. Today, it's just not that simple. And while I would have described this current state of affairs as a sad situation, there are alarmingly some who seem to revel in it even though they are surrounded by conflict themselves. I'm thinking of some of the self-styled Pope's planners that are out there who seem to equate papal authority with the belief that it's impossible for him to do anything wrong and that any criticism of the Pope at any time is merely schismatic. And with the kind of intolerable abuse and corruption we've seen in this era of the church, I. <laughs> That kind of sycophancy is, is the reason it's allowed to persist. These same kinds of apologists 
uh, are at best indifferent to the rampant division and conflict that persists in the church today, or at worst, they actually seem to celebrate it some of the time. Not only do they celebrate it, but they often seem to be instigating a lot of it. And the only reason I can think of for why someone would be indifferent towards serious division in the church is if they want a weakened church. Because that's what conflict does. Division, especially arbitrary division imposed by like bad leadership, that weakens the bonds within the body from the highest levels uh, where we have bishops denouncing other bishops all the way down to local parishes that are being torn apart by church politics. Now again, why would people prefer a weakened church? Um, when there are divisions in the body of Christ, uh, there are some who see that as an opportunity to wedge their own vision of what the church should be according to them in place of what it has always been. They see the chaos that has erupted as an opportunity either for self-advancement or for the advancement of their ideology, which reveals an important historical principle, which is that extremists and their causes tend to benefit the most when there is a crisis. And precisely at this moment of synodality in the church, I think we're seeing heterodox and modernist activists pushing their agenda as hard as they can, so far getting away with it. Uh, look at what's happened in Germany, for example. The German Bishops' Conference has endorsed calls for blessings of same-sex unions, for women's ordination, and a whole host of other explicitly incompatible notions about what the church should be doing. Chaos, division, and a weakened church gives them all openings that they seem to want. And so far, there have been no consequences for their open hostility to the traditional doctrines of the church. But there have been consequences for anyone in the Orthodox side if they make, if they step out of line or make any kind of mistake that can be pounced upon. We've seen some bishops actually removed from their sees, which I didn't even know it's possible. I still don't think that that's actually legitimately possible. We've seen some of the best cardinals in the church today marginalized or just reduced to positions of insignificance. We've seen good Pope Benedict's legacy of liturgical reform completely undone within his lifetime with almost malicious zeal. And we've seen some pretty heinous characters enjoying protection and even promotion from within. Now, it's not wrong or unfaithful or schismatic to make these kinds of criticisms or to point these kinds of things out. I say them out of love for the church because I want to see a strong church able to advance its mission. And if its division and weakened state can be traced to leadership, then leadership deserves to be criticized. And again, it's not wrong to, to offer our criticisms and our feedback. In fact, the working document for the Synod on Synodality for a Synodal Church uh, on, the, on the topic of the census fide says this crazy thing. Alerted by their census fide, individual believers may deny assent even to the teaching of legitimate pastors if they do not recognize in that teaching the voice of Christ, the Good Shepherd. So apparently random lay people, if, if their, their sense of the faith contradicts the teaching of legitimate authorities, they can just deny those teachings, um, which I deny. <laughs> and in so doing, um, I am, I'm practicing what this teaches as well as the orthodox faith. So I'm in agreement on both sides, but if you disagree and say that you can't legitimately criticize the governance or the teachings of the Pope, well, you disagree with both the traditional teaching of the church and the apparent teaching of this synod and this pontiff. But with all of that said, I don't consider myself the right person to be on the vanguard of exposing bad theology or corrupt leadership. I'm grateful for more knowledgeable and more experienced voices out there who are. Uh, for my part, I'm going to stick with what I think I do best, which is commentary on culture and evangelization. But as bleak as things may be, I, I tend to take hope in at least a couple of things. Um, the first is that when you have good leadership, it's easy to take that for granted, to sit back and to be maybe even a little complacent, which isn't good for anyone, least of all for those of us who are being complacent. But when you have bad leadership, um, the quality of your own virtue is put to the test. And I would say many of us have been failing that test, myself included in, at times as this era has been unfolding. Um, but my hope is that this experience will wake us up to the call to take our call to holiness and virtue 
a lot more seriously so that we can be the kind of people that are needed to truly reform the church. The second thing is that if the church really is the body of Christ, um, well, Christ's body has been put through far worse. And it was precisely at moments where it appeared to be most weakened that he was able to do his greatest work. So while things may seem desperate, I'm confident that um, in our weakness, he is at his strongest. Hey, thanks for watching that, especially if you made it this far. If you want to show me some appreciation, you can like and subscribe or check out my website, brianholdsworth.ca for other ways that you can support me. You can also check out one of my sponsors, which is Real Estate for Life, who hosts a network of real estate agents who will likely share your pro-family, pro-Christian, pro-life values, which is really important when it comes to making a big decision like buying a home. So check them out at realestateforlife.org.